Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as the word has now been read, we are praying for your spirit to help us to understand the text before us, that our hearts might receive whatever you have to say to us with faith and obedience. We want you to be glorified in this moment. We want to be built up. We want to be edified by the preached word. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we began a new sermon series in the book of James. We talked there about the role of trials in the Christian life and how God purposely places them along the path of discipleship in order to test us. In other words, all the various difficulties that we experience in life, the opponents that we face, the tragedies we experience, the challenges we have to endure, all of these trials are intended to test us like gold in a furnace. You see, when all of the dross is burned away, what comes out of the furnace of our trials should be pure, stronger, and more precious than what went in. And so that's why our Heavenly Father puts His children through difficult seasons of life so that we come out of those trials with a pure, stronger faith and looking more like our precious Lord and Savior. Well, friends, this morning in our text, James continues this whole conversation on trials, and he's already made an argument back in verse 2 that the trials are inevitable, that it's a matter of when and not whether you're going to face them in life. But now, now the question is how? How will we endure these trials when they come? How are we going to stand up under them and and not be crushed by, by their heavy weight and pressure? I think we can all think of examples of those that we know who were once professing Christians. They claimed to believe in Jesus. They claimed to have been his followers. But after experiencing a a tragic loss or some prolonged suffering, they became disappointed with God and they grew disillusioned. And now they no longer believe in him anymore. I think we've witnessed this pattern before. And we've seen how trials can truly break you. So that's why it's imperative that we understand how we're going to endure them, how to remain steadfast under trials. So that's, that's our focus this morning. We're going to talk about how to maintain a blessed endurance, about how to endure our trials, not, not just with, with white knuckles and, and gritted teeth, but with a true sustaining joy. That's not just endurance, but a blessed endurance. I I think blessed endurance is such an important virtue for us to emphasize because we are living in a day and age where it is rarely cultivated. This is an impulsive, consumer-driven culture where we have to have everything right now. We demand efficiency and and immediacy. I I can't even wait for my package to arrive in two days. I, I need prime now. That's the world we live in, where we demand to have everything right now without having to wait for it or to suffer for it. Endurance, sadly, is not a highly celebrated or cultivated virtue. That is why we so need to talk about it today. Well, what we're going to see James teach in today's passage is that blessed endurance is maintained as we better understand the nature of our trials in light of the God who ordained them. We're going to see as we go through verses 12 to 18, three things. First, that every trial is an occasion for blessed joy. Second, every trial is a threat to fall into temptation. And third, every trial is ultimately a good and perfect gift from above. So the first thing we need to understand about the trials of life, the very nature of these trials, is that everyone is an occasion for blessed joy. Though the trial itself can be painful and filled with deep sorrow, the occasion of meeting that trial can be an experience of sustaining, persevering joy. The kind of joy that serves as a a refuge and stronghold for those trying to weather a terrifying storm. 
I, I know we touched on this idea last week, but it's so important that, that, that we really need to stress it again, just as James stresses this idea twice in this chapter, earlier in verse tw- uh, 2 and now here in verse 12. So let me read verse 12 again. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Now, the James who wrote this letter is commonly understood and identified as the half-brother of Jesus among the sons and daughters that were subsequently born to Joseph and Mary. So as one who was so close to Jesus, one of his family members, it's no surprise that James would offer a beatitude very similar to what his older brother preached in his famous Sermon on the Mount. The word for blessed, the Greek word makarios, can literally be translated as happy. But the thing is, is that few English translations do that either here or in the Sermon on the Mount because the word happy can be misleading. You see, ordinary happiness is understood to be circumstantial and fleeting. It's, des- it's describing for us a subjective felt experience. But if that's the kind of blessedness that we read into verse 12, if we give the impression that Christians ought to feel a subjective happiness while going through fiery trials, well, then we shouldn't be surprised at an alarming rate of people abandoning the faith. Because it would seem as if the God of Scripture is insensitive to our pain, telling us to to simply cheer up and to get it together. So that's why we don't use the word happy. I think happy puts the emphasis in the wrong place. It focuses on how I feel about myself and my situation. But the word makarios is not focused on how we assess ourselves. No, rather it is focused on how God assesses us and our situation. That's why most English translations use the word blessed. We're talking about an objective blessedness, not a subjective happiness. The point is not about how happy you feel when going through a trial, It's about how God feels towards you when he puts you through that trial. James is suggesting that your endurance through trials is proof positive that God loves you, that he has great affection for you. That's why, that's why even though the world looks at your life unraveling and in coming apart and considers you to be cursed, God looks at you and calls you blessed. It's an objective declaration by God that remains true, even if you don't feel it right now. So again, I'm stressing this point because James does, but also because I don't want any of you to get the impression that biblical Christianity tries to to minimize or to deny your pain and suffering. If you are going through a trial right now, feel free. You have the freedom to cry out to God, to lament your situation. James is not telling you just to to buck up and put a smile on your face. Now, his attitude, uh, he, he is alluding really to the same kind of attitude or same kind of joy in trials that the Apostle Paul spoke of for himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, where he describes himself as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Friends, that is a blessed paradox of being sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. And that's not just some kind of unattainable goal for for the super spiritual like like Paul or James. What verse 12 is saying is that no matter how difficult your trial There is a joy that you can experience that runs deeper than ordinary happiness and is rooted not in what you can see, but in what you can believe. By faith and not by sight, you have to believe in the promise of God to give you a crown of life if you remain steadfast in your trials. We briefly talked about these crowns of life last week. And the main thing to recall is that the reward is not really the crown itself, but what the crown represents. 
The crown is metaphorical. That's why scripture always speaks of one day receiving a crown of something. Uh, uh, it could be a crown of righteousness, like in 2 Timothy 4, or a crown of beauty or splendor, like in Isaiah 61, or a, a crown of life, like in Revelation 2, or here in James 1. What's important is the righteousness or the splendor, or the eternal life that's being promised by God. That's the focus. So in our case, James is reminding those who are enduring their trials that these trials are preparing for us the joy of life everlasting with Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's what the crown of life is referring to. It's also important to remember that even though James is borrowing the imagery of of athletic competition, by his reference to these crowns, receiving the crown of life, friends, it is not a competition with other Christians. You are not competing against other Christians to see who gets the biggest or shiniest crown in heaven. No, friends, the beauty of the gospel is that every Christian gets the crown of life. The endurance that we need in the face of our trials is not rooted in our need to perform in order to somehow obtain that crown by our performance. No, the endurance we need is rooted in a promise, in a covenant established by our gracious God. He took on flesh and he put on a crown of thorns so that everyone who trusts in him will get a crown of life. That's that's the promise of the scriptures. So friends, no matter how weak you feel as a Christian, please rest assured that your hope to endure trials lies not in the strength of your will, but in the strength of God's promises to us. For those who love him, For those who have been been called according to his purpose, you can be sure that these trials will will work together for your good. But the fact is, the fact is that even though these trials are meant for our good, their purposes are not always achieved in our lives. Not everyone who faces a trial comes out stronger in faith and more mature in Christ. And It's not due to a fault in God or in his purposes. The fault is really in us and in our response to these trials. And that's really the point being made in verses 13 to 15. So here's the second thing that we need to understand about the nature of trials. Every trial is a threat to fall into temptation. That's why not everyone endures. Instead of counting them all joy and counting them an occasion for spiritual growth, they count their trials as evidence against the goodness of God. What was to be a trial meant to build up their faith has become a temptation that threatens to to destroy that very faith. Notice with me in verse 13 how it seems to suddenly shift gears and to go from a topic of trials to now a discourse on temptations. And so it seems like we've moved on to a brand new subject. But if we were reading this chapter in the original Greek, we would notice that the same root word for trials shows up in verse 13 referring to temptations or to being tempted. The point is that James has not switched subjects at all. He's still referring to the trials that we face, but he's suggesting that there are two ways to view every challenge that we go through in life. You can either respond to it as a test or a a test or a trial that's really meant to build you up, or you can respond to it as a temptation that's going to tear you down. We're talking really about the same event. It could be a loss of employment, the diagnosis of cancer, the heartbreak of a failed relationship, the uncertainty of the future. You can can look at that same event from two different perspectives. It could be a test or it could be a temptation. James recognizes these two perspectives. And in verse 13, he makes a point to say that, From God's point of view, 
The difficulties that you are going through right now are not a temptation to sin. They are a test to build you up. So look at verse 13. He says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. So, in other words, God is not trying to set you up with a trial just to see you fail. Follow, follow James' logic with me. He's saying, God does not tempt anyone because God himself cannot be tempted. And so he's implying that it's not in God's nature to be tempted with evil. So why would he want to encourage the propensity towards evil in our nature? If he's giving us trials in order to mature us, in order to make us more and more like him, then why would he tempt us? That's not in his nature. So God never tempts us, but he does test us. And there are plenty of examples in Scripture of God testing people. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, God tests Abraham with the command to sacrifice Isaac. And he does it in order to purify and strengthen Abraham's faith. And in that instance, Abraham passes the test. He wasn't tempted towards sin and disobedience. Then in Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, God tests the Israelites by only supplying for them a day's worth of manna, teaching them to trust him for their daily bread. But sadly, many of them were tempted to hoard extra manna, which rotted overnight. They failed the test. Their faith proved false. The rotten manna was really symbolic of their rotten faith. And so, yes, there are many more biblical examples that we could look at. Of course, the most notable would, of course, be the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. That's how we typically describe that early episode in his ministry, the temptation of Jesus. But If you do recall, all the gospel accounts, they all say that the Spirit of God led him into the wilderness or even drove him into the wilderness. So it could easily have also been described as the testing of Jesus. From the Father's perspective, it was a test for his Son. But from the devil's perspective, it was a temptation. And for Jesus himself, he experienced it as both. The point is is that In every trial, every trial we face includes within it a temptation to sin. Every trial is a threat to fall into temptation. That's the point. And if we're not careful, we're going to find ourselves giving birth to sin. That's what James goes on to say in verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. James is is saying that if a trial becomes a temptation, God is not to blame here. Your sin nature is really to blame. God isn't trying to tempt us to fail. That's not his intent. It's, it's It's like if a teacher literally gives you a test. And let's say for for whatever reason, you're tempted to cheat. Well, if you get caught, just just see how effective your argument is going to be if you try to blame your teacher for putting you in a situation where you're tempted to cheat. I I don't think anyone is going to buy that excuse. Your teacher, as we all know, wasn't tempting you to fail, but rather testing you to learn, to grow academically. Well, in the same way, when God puts you in a difficult situation, you can either receive it as he intends, as a test, and try to learn from it and to grow spiritually, or you can treat it as a temptation. But just don't blame God when you do. If the Lord puts you in a difficult marriage, just know that he is testing you so that you can learn patience and humility, forgiveness and faithfulness. That's what he intends to grow in you through that difficult marriage. But you could simply treat it as a temptation and end up breaking your vows. Or if the Lord puts you through a health scare, 
He's testing you so that you learn to trust him more, to, to put your security and your future in his hands. But you could simply uh, treat that sickness as a temptation and grow to resent him for not protecting you from it and to begin to rely on him even less. So you can see how in God putting us through a trial, testing us, we could respond wrongly by allowing it to lead us into temptation. So James is concerned with this. He's concerned, obviously, not just to defend the honor of God from our accusations of blaming him, but his concern really is to help us to endure our trials all the while avoiding sin in the process. So that's why in verses 14 and 15, he breaks down for us the process of how sin matures over time, starting from just a little desire and ending in spiritual death. So listen to verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So the point here is that sin arises not from the circumstances that we find ourselves in or that God puts us in, but rather, no, sin arises from our own desires. Because of our fallen nature, because we are fallen people, there exists in each of us carnal, fleshly desires for sin. We have sinful cravings. Now, James makes a very careful distinction here. Notice how he distinguishes between the desire for sin and sin itself. So you can have the desire, and that's not sin, but if you let the desire conceive, well, then it gives birth to sin. So the obvious question is, what does it mean for desire to conceive? Well, obviously, James is using the metaphor of making a baby, of conceiving a child with someone. Now, let's be very clear. Your carnal, fleshly desires are actually a part of you. They're not some object outside of you. But for the sake of this metaphor, James wants us to picture uh, our sinful desires as a metaphorical woman that you can either abstain from or you can entertain her and conceive a child with her. And just realize it's going to be a very quick gestation period. When you and sinful desire conceive, she gives birth very quickly. And once that sin is born, if you don't repent of it, if you allow it to hang around and to grow up, well, then it's going to bring forth death. It'll grow up and turn around and kill you. Again, friends, this is a metaphor. But it does teach us three important lessons about sin and temptation that James is trying to stress. First of all, be assured that the desire to sin, the temptation to sin, realize that it in itself is not culpable or blameworthy. Don't feel guilty for simply struggling with many desires and temptations. It really all depends on what you do with them. So that's the first lesson. The second lesson is this. When you have those desires, don't entertain them. Don't flirt with temptation. Don't test yourself to see how close you can get before falling into her seductive arms. When sinful desire beckons you and calls for your attention, don't give her the time of day. Give her the cold shoulder. Ignore her. The moment you give desire even a fraction of your attention, that's when you get lured. That's when you get enticed, and together you conceive sin. But here's the third lesson. You can only hold out and ignore your desires for so long. Eventually, you're going to cave. Eventually, you will give in. The only real solution is for there to be a fundamental change in your desires. 
And that's what James alludes to in verse 18. Listen to verse 18. Of his own will, this is God's will, by God's will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits for his creatures, of his creatures. So James here is talking about regeneration. He's talking about being born again, about our new birth in Christ. And notice with me how verse 15 is paralleled with verse 18. You see, the problem in verse 15 is that sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. Well, the solution in verse 18 is for God, by his gracious will, to bring forth new life in us, where we become a new kind of creature. We are the first fruits of a new creation. This, my friends, is how the Christian faith sufficiently deals with sin and temptation. We don't just try to avoid our desires or or to suppress and, and hold them down. No, that's no real solution. We all know that we will eventually cave in. That's why the Christian faith offers more than just good advice on how to curb your desires. No, it offers good news on how to transform your desires altogether. The gospel says, That Jesus took on flesh, and just like us, he had a human nature. But unlike us, he walked in perfect step with the Spirit of God, and he never gave in to temptation. He was able to fully abstain from the allurement and the enticement of carnal desires. But though he was without sin, he died a sinner's death on the cross, bearing our sins on his shoulders and by his blood we are cleansed and we are forgiven of our sins and and it's by his spirit that he now dwells in those who receive him by faith who trust in him as lord and savior and if if anyone is in christ the bible says you are a new creation The old has gone. The new has come. You are born again with new desires. But friends, realize that doesn't mean that your carnal, sinful desires are fully eradicated. You have to understand that even though we are new creations in Christ, the Christian life calls for continual vigilance in resisting the allurement and enticement of those desires. But you see, now that you have the new birth, now that you have new desires in your heart for Christ and for the things of God, you can now cultivate those desires and give yourselves wholly to them. And just see for yourself, by when, when you focus to cultivating those desires, just see for yourself how those godly desires carry within themselves an expulsive power that has the ability to progressively rid your heart of those lesser carnal cravings. So give yourself to the godly desires of the Spirit, desires for Christ, desires for His gospel. So friends, just as James uh, took a moment to explain the nature of sin and temptation for us, that's what we wanted to do, the same thing. But of course, we need to return to the main focus, which is not about the nature of sin and temptation, but really about the nature of trials. Because a better understanding of the nature of trials is going to better prepare us to endure them. That's our point. So we've already seen so far that every trial is an occasion for blessed joy, and yet it is also a threat to fall into temptation. But here's a third thing that we need to understand. Every trial is ultimately a good and perfect gift from God. Look at verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So James recognizes there's a lie out there, a lie that Christians can easily fall for. And that's why he warns us not to be deceived. You see, no matter how difficult your trial can be, no matter how how it's lasting much longer than you were prepared for, no matter how silent or distant that you feel God is, don't fall for the lie that says that he has turned his back on you and abandoned you in your trials. 
If that thought has crossed your mind recently, well, just know that it's the enemy trying to deceive you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And then turn your attention to the God who never changes. That's what James reminds us of in verse 17. Listen there. Verse 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So the emphasis here is on the fact that there is no variation, no changing in God. You know, now that the summer is here, and now that days are much longer, if you just go walking in the late afternoon, you'll notice how your shadow is stretching longer and longer. And that's, of course, because one of the great heavenly lights, the sun, is constantly changing. It's moving across the sky, and it's casting a shadow that is constantly changing. Because the sun is shifty, your shadow is shifty. It changes all day long. But God, but God is different. Heavenly lights change, but the father of lights never changes. He's not shifty. He doesn't change. He remains the same. Now, what's James's point here? Well, his point is that our heavenly father doesn't give his children bad gifts. He never has and he never will because he never changes. James deduces that all from God's unchanging nature. He says that if in, in the past, good and perfect gifts have always come from our unchanging God, then be assured that only good and perfect gifts are going to come from him now and on into the future. So why, why would we expect anything different? Why would we assume that now, as we're going through suffering, as we're going through difficulty, why would our loving Father suddenly turn his back on us and give us temptations just to see us fail? When we start thinking that way, it's because we're trying to assess our trials on the basis of how we feel in that moment. But we know that our feelings change all the time. Our feelings are not a reliable guide. Why don't we just let God and God's word, which both never change, why don't we let those be our sure guide to understand the true nature of trials? When God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, I'm not surprised if in that moment Abraham felt like God had changed, that this is suddenly a, a different God I'm dealing with. Is this test really a good and perfect gift? When God told Moses to wake up, to to walk up to the most powerful man on the planet of, uh, 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 on the face of the planet and to threaten to kill his firstborn son if he doesn't listen, I'm not surprised if Moses felt like God might have changed. We're killing kids now? And, And you want me to say that to this man? Is this Exodus really a good and perfect gift? When God told the people of Israel to cross the Red Sea, trusting that these walls of water will not come crashing down. Or when God told them to walk around Jericho seven times and to simply shout and to trust that the walls will come crashing down. I'm not surprised if the people felt like God had changed. Does he really know what he's doing now? And of course, when the disciples stood at the foot of the cross, staring at the lifeless body of their master, of their friend. I'm not surprised if they felt like God had changed. I'm sure it felt like he had turned his back on them, that he had abandoned them in his trials, just like he apparently abandoned Christ on the cross. But of course, what seems so cruel and senseless completely changed in their eyes after that first Easter morning. Everything began to look different. Every trial the disciples faced from that day on was now seen from a different light. They began to look at everything through the lens of the resurrected Christ. 
And that, my friends, is why James could say without any reservation that everything a Christian experiences in this life, no matter how painful, no matter how difficult, is truly a good and perfect gift from above. When we are in the midst of a trial, we can't trust our feelings to be a sure and reliable guide. It's going to feel like God is distant when actually he's by your side. It's going to feel like he's turned his back on you when actually his face is shining on you. Whatever you're going through is going to feel like a cruel and severe punishment when it's actually a good and perfect gift from our Heavenly Father above. Let's pray to him. Father, we thank you for your goodness, for your loving kindness, and we thank you that you never change. You have never given us a bad gift, and you never will. So whatever we're going through now, Lord, give us the eyes of faith to see them as not a temptation to sin, but a test to purify our faith and to make us more like your son, Jesus. Oh, Lord, whatever you have planned for us in our lives, whatever trial you ordain for us, we want to count them as an occasion for joy. We want to see you glorified in our lives as we find joy even in the difficulty of life. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.